A great controversy rages between good and evil. Okay, here we and go, humanity folks. humanity is Live. caught in the crossfire. Satan has crafted his most cunning end-time deceptions, but his plans are doomed to fail. Get ready to anchor your minds in truth as the Bible exposes his lies and prepares us for our soon coming Satan. And now, live from the Campus Hill Church of Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California, we bring you this presentation of The Great Controversy, End Time Deceptions. Hello, and once again, we want to thank you for joining us from around the world. We're here in Loma Linda, California. We're having a great time in the Lord. I hope you just were able to watch and view the first hour. We had some incredible music. I got started getting chill bumps back there and had to kind of rub them down. They were getting all over me under the anointing of the Holy Spirit under the music. But it's my privilege to, tonight to introduce a longtime friend and uh, a minister of the gospel, uh, one of the greatest voices uh, on the planet. If I can say that, I don't think I'm the only one that thinks that. Millions of people agree with me on that. But what I love about Pastor Wentley Phipps is he gives all honor and glory and praise to God. I love his wife, Linda. She's over here, a beautiful wife and supports him, and they've supported each other, wonderful marriage, great kids, and I, I appreciate what you do, uh, Linda, for the cause of God and your love for Jesus. It shines through, and uh, we're so thankful for Pastor Phipps. Now, he's going to be speaking tonight, the, ma the battle for the mind, but I wanted to tell you that he just told me, I said, is anything big, just a moment ago, something I can tell the folk? And he said, yes, if you go to my website, wentleyphipps.com, the song he's about to do, and many of you probably have heard this before. I think I heard it the first time he did it, Carnegie Hall, I think, with the Gaithers, maybe. Uh, the Amazing Grace, he said, if you go to the website, you can download it absolutely free. Listen to it. Enjoy it. So, once again, I appreciate Pastor Phipps, that he's not only pastor of a church, but he's an evangelist. He travels around the world, has had a tremendous influence on many of our political leaders, and if any time... The, in our nation's history that our leaders need to see somebody they can depend on and somebody's willing to talk to them about Jesus, I think it's now, don't you? So I'm thankful that God has given him these open doors to meet so many people and to influence an entire nation. So uh, without further ado, again, it's my privilege to introduce my brother, Pastor Wentley Phipps. Through men 
open your holy word. I ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power. Speak to me, through me, and for me. I promise you, Lord, I'll always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And I want to thank this ministry, 3ABN, for what God has done through it all around this world. Amen. Let the church say amen. amen. My message tonight, the battle for the mind. The Bible tells of a day when Jesus and his disciples climbed out of their boat as they waded to the shore, they were startled by the sight of a man running towards them. His flesh was torn and bloodied, his eyes covered by long matted hair. He looked more like a wild beast than a human being. According to the Bible, this man who lived in the cemetery near the shore his mind was possessed by demons. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles with superhuman strength, he would break the chains apart. No one, it seemed, was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered through the cemetery, howling and screaming and cutting himself with sharp stones. He was so dangerous, no one dared approach him. That day, as he ran towards the disciples, half naked, bleeding, foaming at the mouth, the disciples considered it the better part of valor to run the other way, rather than confront this man whose mind was demon-possessed. As they ran, they looked back to see how much distance they had created between this madman and themselves. And what they saw left them startled and astonished. There was Jesus, not running with them. Instead, Jesus was standing in front of that madman, calm and confident, 
composed and self-assured, Jesus raised his hand in a quiet gesture of authority and the possessed man stopped dead in his tracks. The Bible then tells us that the demons who controlled the mind of that man began to speak. The Bible says in Luke 8:28, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou Son of God, most high, I beseech thee, torment me not. The demons addressed him, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high. You know what? Every demon in hell knows who Jesus is. Every demon in rebellion knows who they are up against. My Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. That means to me every demon will one day acknowledge him as Lord. Amen. The demon inside the man shouted, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Why are you interfering and bothering with me? Did you come here to torture and punish me? And then Jesus asked the demon-possessed man, What is your name? He said, my name is Legion. There are many of us demons living inside the mind of this man. The chief demon said to Jesus, give us permission to leave this man's mind and enter the herd of pigs over there. Jesus said unto them, permission granted, but you must leave at once. And then suddenly, with the might and power of a cleansing wind, those unclean spirits left the mind of that possessed man and entered into that herd of pigs and then threw themselves off of a cliff into the waters below. The farmers who owned the pigs ran back to the village testifying, come see a man who has the power to triumph over a demon-possessed mind. Come see a man who has the power to bring back sanity and stability to a mind that is not thinking straight. Come see a man who has the power to evict demons seeking to rid your soul of righteous thoughts and spiritual thinking. Come see a man who has the power to be victorious in the battle for the control of the human mind. When the villagers arrived, they saw that same man who had terrorized the countryside sitting at the feet of Jesus, calm and collected, <laughs> rational and sensible. And that same man who had flung threats and curses at them they now saw him singing the praises of God and glorifying his name. Those villagers wondered aloud, what kind of man is this who can, with a word, liberate a mind from the control of demons? What kind of man is this who can rescue a mind from damnation and death? Oh, I love the way the Bible says it. It says, when the people came to Jesus, they found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, comma, clothed, comma, and in his right mind. Now, now I admit to you, as a young man listening to preachers waxing eloquent on this scripture, what I heard seemed so poetic simply because they left out the comma. Look at it, Luke 8.35, it says, Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, comma, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. But what I heard those preachers saying was, he was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, in his right mind. 
Anyone here to know today it is a blessing to be clothed in your right mind? All of us are in a battle for the mind, and this battle manifests itself in the severity of the opioid crisis that we see and the drug epidemic in a nation awash in beer and liquor. One of the reasons I don't drink is because as much as possible, I want to be clothed in my right mind. I want to be in control of my mind. Reminds me of a story I read of a drunk husband who snuck up the stairs after being in a fist fight at a local bar. He quietly went into the bathroom, looked into the mirror, and he bandaged up all the bumps and bruises he saw on his face. And then he climbed into bed, smiling at the thought that he had pulled one over on his wife. When morning came, he opened his eyes and there stood his wife over him. She said, you were drunk last night, weren't you? No, honey, he replied, I wasn't drunk. Well then, she said, who put all those band-aids on the bathroom mirror? <laughs> it's a blessing to be clothed in your right mind. And every day, whether we realize it or not, all of us are engaged in spiritual warfare. And this battle for the mind began in the very courts of heaven. In God's perfect heaven, the devil con gained control of the minds of a third of the angels. And ever since then, the devil has been in a vicious battle for the mind. It was in heaven where he learned that the way you gain control of minds is through the use of lies, falsehoods, and deception. It was Adolf Hitler who once said, to control the minds of people, you have to tell really big lies and tell them often. And in the Garden of Eden, he told Eve one of the biggest lies that has ever been told. When he said to Eve, you shall not surely die, that was a lie. But it wasn't the biggest lie he told. The biggest lie the devil told was the biggest lie in the universe that can be told. That God doesn't always tell the truth. You shall not surely die. You can't get a lie bigger than that. In 2007, after seeing hundreds of tornadoes hit his state, State Senator Ernie Chambers of Nebraska filed a lawsuit against God. Yes, seeking a permanent injunction against God's harmful activities. activities. He said the lawsuit accuse God of not being kind and loving as he portrayed himself to be. Oh, and I love this, I love this. The suit went all the way to the Nebraska Supreme Court where it was finally thrown out, dismissed. I love this, because God could not be properly notified <laughs> because he has an unlisted home address. Throughout history, the devil has accused and impeached the character of God. He's charged God with lying and false misrepresentation, and through treachery, lies, and deception, he has won the battle for so many minds. Oh, but friends, somewhere I read in Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Friends, God cannot lie. And John 8, 44 says, Ye of your father, 
the devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of lies. I want you to know that the devil has in his toolbox strategies that are well capable of ruining and deceiving the minds of perfectly spiritual human beings. And why is the devil battling for the human mind? First of all, the human mind is amazing. It was William James who once said, the greatest discovery of my generation is that a human being can alter his life by changing his mind. If you continue to believe as you've always believed, you will always feel like you've always felt, and you will always continue to act the way you've always acted. But if you want different results in your life, or in your work, or in your marriage, or in your home, what you have to do is change the way you think. This year, this year, I've been married for 44 years. And early in my marriage, I settled it in my mind. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, my wife can ever say or do that will cause me to be angry with her. Yes, I said it. In other words, if you change the way you think, it will change the way you feel. And that will change the way you act. It was John Alston who once said, if you don't control your mind, someone else will. Controlling what enters your mind is critical to your spiritual survival. Now, the ability to think is the most important gift we have as human beings. Years ago, a man who bought a new gadget, unassembled, of course, you know, like at Christmas, you buy all this stuff and none of it is assembled. And he read and reread the instructions, and as much as he could, he couldn't figure out how to put it together. Finally, sought the help of an old handyman who was working in his backyard. The old fella picked up all the pieces, studied them carefully, and then began assembling the gadget. In a short time, he had put it together. That's amazing, said the man. And you did it without even looking at the instructions. The fact is, said the old man, I can't read. <laughs> and then he said, and when a fella can't read, he's got to think. <laughs> because we can think we can choose. And because we can choose, we can love. For without the power of choice, we cannot love. And because we can think with God's help, with God's help, we, because we can think, we can mold our lives into harmony with the character of God. Friends, our minds are the fountain of our choices, the foundation of our spiritual lives, and that's why our minds are the focus of the enemy's wrath because it is in our minds that we get to emulate the character of Christ. It is in our minds that we get to grow every day to more closely resemble, reflect, and reveal the character of God. And that's why the devil is battling for the human mind, because it, it is with our minds that we get to give God glory, and the glory of God is his character. Amen. The mind is the foundation upon which we build godly and Christ-like character. And if the foundation be destroyed, the Bible says, what can the righteous do? Well, the devil knows if he can control our minds, he can chip away at the foundation of our spiritual lives. If he can control our minds, he can erode our character and our resemblance and our likeness to the character of God. Oh, I just hope you're listening to me today. 
In Matthew 24, 24, Jesus gives one of the most sobering warnings about the devil's ability to deceive our minds. Matthew 24, 24 says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now those words, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, is a warning that says the devil is able to deceive in such a way that not even the elect, not even God's chosen people are safe. He is able to deceive even the very elect so that not even God's remnant people are immune from the danger of being deceived. Without God's help, not even the most spiritual among us are safe from the ability of the devil to deceive. You see, for millenniums, the devil has been practicing how to do battle with and how to capture the minds of the most spiritual among us. I'm an avid student of history, and I can tell you that in every era and every age, the battle for the human mind has been raging. I can tell you that throughout history, the devil has demonstrated a knack and an uncanny ability to deceive some of the most select and elect and privileged servants of God. I, I think it was about 30 years ago as a pastor, I began asking myself this question, why do Christians who know so much about Jesus consistently behave so badly? How is it that devout Bible-carrying Christians can be so easily deceived? First of all, that's what happens when being like the character of Christ is not the central focus of your faith. So you embrace doctrine and you don't see the need to continue to be like Christ. How is it that even elect spiritual people can be so easily deceived? Well, well, think about this. How do you go from being a Noah, a righteous preacher for 120 years, a preacher who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, survived the flood, to ending up being in a naked, drunken stupor. How do you go from being an Abraham, the father of the faithful, to lying about your wife, not being your wife, but being your sister, and then telling another man you can take her with you? How do you go from being a humble, godly woman like Sarah to forcing your husband to have sex with another woman with, <laughs> with your knowledge and consent? How do you go from being a Moses, the humblest, meekest man on the face of the earth, to losing the ability to enter the promised land because of your inability to control your anger and cool your temper? The enemy, brothers and sisters, has the power to deceive even the very elect. How do you go from being a faithful priest of God like Aaron and still you build an idol to a false god after watching the Red Sea part? How do you go from being a Miriam rescued from the grip of slavery and prejudice and then yourself show racial prejudice to a woman of color because she married your brother? How do you go from being an Elijah, the prophet, hero at Mount Carmel, and then run from the threats of an inept, wicked queen? How do you go from being a Saul, chosen by God to be king of Israel, and then become a psychotic, paranoid maniac? How do you go from being a David, Writing, the Lord is my shepherd. He wasn't his shepherd that day. <laughs> How do you go from being a man after God's own heart 
to being a sex-driven, lust-filled adulterer and murderer? How do you go from being a Solomon, the, the wisest man in the world, to doing something as dumb as marrying 700 wives and, <laughs> and having 300 mistresses? Nothing smart about that. I don't care how you cut it. You only do something like that when you've lost your cotton-picking mind. <laughs> How do you go, check this out, how do you go from being a Martin Luther, the spark of the Protestant Reformation, a pioneer of religious freedom and religious liberty, to calling Jews dogs and devils? and advocating that their homes and synagogues be burnt to the ground in honor of our Lord. How do you go from being a Martin Luther, the spark of the Protestant Reformation, to writing that when it comes to Jews, God will not hold it against us if we kill them all. That's what he said. We are not at fault in slaying them. That's because even the very elect can be deceived. How can the brave, righteous pilgrims who fled religious persecution in Europe and come to these shores of America, led of God, and then turn around and persecute and torture? Yes, they did, pilgrims. They tortured other people. They, had, they did something called flailing, which is when you, flailing a person alive, you peeled the skin off of their head and their face while they were living. How do you do that? It's because Jesus warned that even the very elect can be deceived. How do you go from being a church-going, God-fearing Christian like George Washington to owning black people as slaves and cruelly shipping members of the same slave family thousands of miles away because of an infraction against the rules on your plantation. I am amazed how brilliant spiritual minds can be so easily deceived, and you are deceived if you do not think it can happen today and is happening today. I know without the help and protection of God, he can deceive any one of us. The devil can deceive any one of us in here. And so I ask God, show me some of the weapons the devil has used successfully throughout human history to corrupt and capture the minds of perfectly spiritual people. I ask God, let, let me peek into his bag of tricks. Show me what he uses to deceive even the very elect. And God showed me four strategies the enemy of our souls uses effectively in his battle for the human mind. The first is power. Power. When Christian people get power, worldly power, economic power, military power, and yes, political power, when Christians get political power, that power turns intelligent Christians into immoral Christians. And hear me, I'm going to say some tough things today, but God's with me. Christianity without the character of Christ is the very definition of corruption. And you can couch it in, 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 in your religiosity, in policy. Mm -hmm. You can dress it up in rules and carefully crafted, committee-endorsed, well-worded statements. But if your policies are not in harmony with the character of Christ, you might as well throw them in the garbage. Your Christianity is corrupt. When ministers, oh, I'm going to get, uh, you praying for me? When ministers jockey and scheme and politic 
for temporary title and positions. This is not reflective of the character of Christ. Look at what the servant of the Lord says. She says, it is a mistake for a conference to select as a president one who considers that his office places unlimited power in his hands. And look at this. She says, a man's position does not make him one jot or tittle greater in the sight of God. It is character alone that God values. God is not impressed with your title. A Christ-like character is more valuable in the eyes of God than having president in front of your name. And so sometimes, sometimes you have to look beyond the veneer of fake holiness and speak clearly when people condone unchristlike methods that hurt other people. When you stand by silent, when other people are being wronged and harmed by those who have power, that is unchristlike. To be silent when leaders that we like are hurting other people and hurting other people because they have power. That silence is unchristlike. So often the temptation to rule over other people corrupts our spiritual sensibilities and hijacks all that is honorable and virtuous and good in us. The temptation to rule over other people perverts our powers of righteous reasoning and honorable conduct. Power is a temptation that has deceived even the very elect and chosen of God's servants. So power is the first strategy the devil uses in the battle of the mind. The next weapon the devil uses in this battle for the mind is pride. The promise of the serpent in the garden of Eden to Eve was, you will be as God. This appeal to Eve's pride, and pride is well capable of corrupting the minds of the most devout spiritual people. I am the smartest. Who ever told you a thing like that? I, I am the most intelligent. Pride, amongst other things, pride is the temptation to feel superior to other people physically culturally, financially, pride. My friend Dr. E. E. Cleveland used to say that better off doesn't mean better than. The moment you begin to believe you are better than, your heart is filled with pride. Whoever told you that different meant deficient? Pride is the temptation to be seen as superior to others, and the enemy has used pride to deceive even the most spiritual of minds. It is pride that causes us to forget, as the Word of God says in Acts 17, 26, and God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. You know, I, I, it, when I, I was in the crowd to welcome Nelson Mandela when he came out of prison, and one of the things about apartheid, they would say, but you didn't read the other part of that scripture. It says God has appointed bounds of habitation. And they interpreted that to mean that it was God's will that people of different shades of color be separated by geographic boundaries. Pride. It is pride that makes us forget, as Galatians 3.28 says, In Christ there is no Jew nor Greek, nor bond nor free, nor male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. It is pride that makes us forget what Romans says in Romans 2.11, For with God there is no respecter of persons. Pride of race can be so seductive and deceptive that some Christians will put their race above their redemption. 
They'll put their pride of race before their Christ. Pride of race is a lie that deceives even the very elect of Christians. I heard a man say, well, I can't help it if my race is smart and good looking too. Pride. The next weapon the devil uses in his battle for the minds of spiritual people is presumption. Presumption is the mistaken belief that you can enjoy the blessing of God's promises while refusing to comply with the conditions God has placed on those promises. Presumption is believing that God does not require you to always live in harmony with his character and his principles. Presumption is, yeah, means I can get a day off from being kind when I want to. Presumption is the belief that if I hurt others in pursuit of noble ends, God will understand even if it means to support the torture of others and deny other people their God-given freedoms and blessings, God will understand. You look at what the servant of the Lord says. She said, Eve, Eve fell because she flattered herself that God was too kind to punish her for disobedience of his expressed commands. My God, presumption. It is one of the weapons the devil uses skillfully in his battle for the mind. Presumption is a common temptation. And as Satan, look at what she says, as Satan assails men, are you listening to me today? Presumption is a common, it is a what? A common temptation. And as Satan assails men with this, with presumption, he obtains the victory nine times out of ten over those who profess to be followers of Christ. Woo. The next weapon in his arsenal that Satan uses to deceive even the very elect is pleasure. Genesis 3, 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat pleasure, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15. On all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. Friends, pleasure is when the desire to feel good becomes more important than the obligation to do good. Pleasure is when the temptation to feel right. Oh, this feels good. When it overwhelms the sense of duty to do what is right. And throughout history, these four, power, what did I say? Power. The next one is pride, presumption, and pleasure. These have been the devil's most successful weapons in his battle for the mind. These are the weapons that have consistently deceived the very elect. Power, Pride, presumption, and pleasure. And before I leave you today, I want to tell you about the greatest weapon God has given to us in the battle for the mind. It's found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 26, verse 3. Look at what the Word of God says there. It says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Brothers and sisters, we are up against ways of thinking that have invaded and corrupted the church and are compromising the purity of the church's mission and the integrity of its witness. And these ways of political thinking are powerful enough to deceive even the very elect. If, can, can, I, can, I, can I talk it straight tonight? Amen. If you find yourself quoting more of what you hear on CNN than what you have read about in the Word of God, about the character of God, the devil is winning in the battle for your mind. 
If you find yourself quoting more of what you heard on Fox News than what you have read about the character of God in the Word of God, the devil is winning in the battle for your mind. I believe God has personally given me a quote that has been a blessing, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. Look at what God told me one day. God said, if your faith gives you permission to be anything other than Christ-like at all times, your faith has been corrupted and compromised. If your faith, if you got the kind of faith that gives you permission to be anything other than Christ-like at all times, your faith has been corrupted and compromised. Look at what the servant of the Lord said. She said, by yielding the mind to the control of the Spirit, you will grow into the likeness of God's perfect character and you will become an instrumentality through which he can reveal his mercy, his goodness, and his love. Yeah. Hallelujah! In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Uh, that includes your mind. Hallelujah, God. Your mind. If you let God, God will renew your mind. He will he'll give you an ability to manage the influences that are trying to determine your destiny. That's why David in Psalm 26, 2, that's why he said, God, continually examine my mind, examine me. He was saying, it, look at my foot, look at my hands. No, no, no. Examine my thoughts. Examine me. Prove me. Try my mind and my heart. And in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and a sound mind. God has promised us victory in the battle for the mind. And can I give you before I leave, this is your most important, powerful weapon in the battle for your mind. Isaiah 26, thou will keep him in perfect peace. But what do you have to do? Keep your mind stayed on. And why should we keep our mind stayed on God? Look at what Ellen White says. This is, this is awesome. She says, Satan cannot control. Look at this. Satan cannot control minds unless they are yielded to his control. And look at this one. I love this. Walk with God like Enoch walked with God. Keep your mind stayed on God. And how do you walk and talk with God? You know, God gave me this perspective. We see lives as a symphony of activity punctuated by moments of communion with God. I think you need to turn that on its head and see your life as a symphony of communion with God punctuated by distractions. And when the distractions are over, go back to that symphony of communion maintaining a mind connected with the mind of God. Constantly monitor your thoughts. And God gave me this when I was preaching the other day. Think about what you're thinking about. Think about what you're thinking about. Look at what Ellen White says. This is blow, 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 blow your mind. She said, look at what she says. She says, the only safety for the human agent who is striving for an immortal crown is to live in hourly contact, in conscious, loving communion with the highest principles God has set forth in his word. That's the only way to be safe. Keeping your mind connected with the mind of God. It's the only way to be safe. But pastor, can I do that and brush my teeth? Oh, yes, you can. You better talk to God. 
Can I do that while I'm talking to my children? The most important thing you could ever do is talk to your God while talking to your children. Oh, yeah, and talk to the Lord while you're talking to your husband too. And when your thoughts stray, bring them back. When you keep your mind stayed on Jesus, I love this. You keep the enemy off balance. You keep him baffled. When you keep your mind stayed on Jesus, you keep de demons confounded. Amen. Amen. When you're not thinking about anything, train your mind to have a default train of thought. <laughs> hey, 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 I'm about to give you something blessed. When you're not thinking about anything, train your mind to have a default thought. And what, that, what should that default thought be? Let that default thought be, God, what can I do to honor you next? Just show me, what can I do? Let that be your prayer. Servant of God says, the Christian whose heart is stayed upon God cannot be overcome. Also, listen to this song. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should my heart be lonely? Hallelujah. Listen to the message in this song. Hallelujah. The battle for the mind. Keep your mind stay on Jesus. Because his eye is on the sparrow. Keep your mind stay on Jesus. Why should the shadows fall? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven? And home when Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He. His eye, and I know watching over me his eyes on the sparrow and I know he's watching over me I say because I'm happy, yes. Oh Lord, I say because I'm free for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he's watching. watching over me I know he's watching over me I know he's watching over me I say because I'm happy yes. oh Lord you know I say watching 
Father, teach us how to walk with God like Enoch walked with God. Teach us in this wicked, whirling world how to keep our minds stayed on Thee. Teach us how to be victorious in the, in the battle for our thoughts, for our thinking, and for our minds. Lord, we know this is a battle that we will be in until Jesus comes. We will be in this battle until we close our eyes in death or oh, until our eyes behold the glory of God. Show us how to be victorious and walk with Jesus moment by moment, day by day. This is my prayer for all who hear this call from God today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Let us not be seduced by power, pride, presumption, or pleasure. God bless you. So much, Pastor Phipps. The Lord used you tonight. Thank you.